So welcome everybody, welcome to this keynote lecture by uh, Professor Simona Piatoni, the lecture on regional voices in multi-level politics and the pandemic. This uh, lecture is the keynote lecture as part of this conference on uh, regions in the EU from takers to shapers. Uh, it's part of the conference organized by the University of uh, Tübingen by myself. My name is Gabriela Abels. I'm professor of comparative politics and European integration here at Tübingen. And it's jointly organized with the Regiopal project uh, by the University of Krems on uh, the role of regional parliaments in the EU and jointly with the Arbeitskreis Europäische Integration. And uh, I would also like to mention that this lecture is at the same time organized in cooperation with the European Center for Research on federalism uh, hosted by the University of Tübingen. So it's uh, my pleasure that it's also the uh, HZFF annual lecture. I'm very happy that uh, you're here with us, uh, Simona, and I would uh, like to introduce you to our audience, although at least the academic audience uh, will be very familiar with your work already, because it's just absolutely uh, impossible to circumvent your work if somebody is uh, interested in the role of region and governance in, in Europe. So, um, uh, Professor Simona Piatoni uh, has uh, first degrees from University of Milan, then a PhD from the MIT in uh, the US. She was a professor at the Institute of Political Science, University of uh, Tromso in Norway. Uh, for 20 years, she's now professor of political science at the University of Trento in Italy, where she teaches comparative politics, local government, European integration, issues of democ democracy and governance. And she is a research professor at ARENA Center, uh, which is hosted at the University of Oslo in Norway. She has had a number of visiting professorships and fellowships at uh, universities uh, around the world, like uh, Innsbruck, uh, ACTA Norway, European University Institute in Florence, Max Planck Institute Cologne, but also University of California in Berkeley. And uh, she was also here in Tübingen, um, as a fellow when we had here the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence called Pride. And uh, Simona has had many positions in the scientific community, among them being the president of the European Consortium of Political Research, the ECPR. And until recently, she was uh, president of the Italian Political Science Associations. Out of her many, many um, publications, I would uh, like to mention a few. Uh, very important is, well, many of them are important, but for our issue, particularly the theory of multi-level governance um, published 2010 by Oxford University Press, which is a theoretical discussion of, of MLG as a concept. Uh, more recent, the Handbook on Cohesion Policy in the EU, which she co-edited and um, also uh, co-authored uh, Shaping EU Policy from uh, Below EU Democracy and the Committee of the Regions, one of, or I would say, the first uh, theoretical account of the work of uh, the COR, the institution which we have addressed many times already here in the conference and then she was uh, editor of um, the EU democratic principles and institutional architectures in times of crisis 2015 and uh, very early work uh, about informal governance in the European Union. So this is just uh, some of the book Simona has uh, written, uh, authored and edited here on the issue. And from this uh, short overview of her books, you can already see that her research 
uh, starting with local politics, but then going more into uh, regional politics, the EU, the, uh, the uh, interlinkages among these different levels, a lot of work she has done on European uh, cohesion policy and always linking that to issues of democracy, uh, EU multi-level governance. So uh, she's the perfect speaker for this annual lecture and for the keynote of this conference. And now I'm looking forward uh, to what you would like to discuss with us, uh, Simona, on the region of voices in multi-level politics and the pandemic. And before I hand, hand over to you, just a word to the um, to the audience, please make use of the chat function continuously to write in uh, your comments and ideas so that we can feed them into the discussion with Simona after her presentation. So thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. And without further ado, I hand the mic over to you, Simona. Well, thank you very much, Gabriele, um, for this splendid presentation that lends a lot more coherence to my work than I ever dreamed of. Um, before I begin, allow me to ask, um, for how long do, would you want to, me to speak for? Um, just it's you can, you, you can you have like 30 minutes and then we have uh, tw like 20 minutes for discussion. So that OK, way. very good. Yeah, um, so again, thanks uh, for inviting me to this conference, which I unfortunately could not really uh, follow due to many other conflicting engagements. And um, hello to everyone, even though I don't really see you, but uh, you know, I see just your avatars or your names. Um, but so um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I have to admit, it was a, um, a more of a pleasure to be in person in Tübingen a few years back uh, under the, the wonderful uh, tree that you have there in the courtyard and uh, eating pretzels shaped like a euro. Um, so, but, uh, you know, this is the situation. Uh, by way of disclaimer, let me uh, say uh, the following that, you know, my interest in the, in the Committee of the Regions, but in, you know, in the regional voice more generally, and in the various policies that, of course, are at the center of regional uh, concerns and interests is, is continuing, is never relented. But um, more recently, I have been, let's say, distracted a little bit, uh, let's say, since the publication of the book, uh, Shaping Policy from Below, to which Gabriele was making a, a reference. Um, because I analyzed also the effect of the Euro crisis on two countries, Italy and Germany, not by surprise. Um, and so, you know, I did more of this sort of, um, you know, tight comparison and, and uh, between these two countries and the systemic forces that have affected their performance during the Euro crisis. But uh, so this to say that I'm returning to this interest in the, um, into the exploration of the regional voice um, and the committee of the regions in particular, uh, now after, you know, a sort of a hiatus. Um, and this in a way goes to justify why I have, um, I could not uh, carry out uh, on the ground research that would be absolutely necessary in order to sort of test whether the ideas that I, I want to share with you have any purchasing power. Um, so the audience is certainly very, um, you know, attuned to these themes, though I, I hope I'm not repeating things that you already know. Um, but let me start by, and, I, and I, I'm not going to share any, any PowerPoints, allow me to just uh, hold this conversation in this informal way because you know, the, the semester has been very, very exacting and very tough. Um, you know, many courses, most of them in presence, plus recording, plus streaming. So it's been nonstop, basically, work this year. So, and also last year. So um, to start with the regional voice, I like this expression, as you know. Um, Gabriele reminded um all of us that a while ago uh, in 2015 with, uh, with uh, Justus Schönlau, um, I elaborated in this book, Shaping Policy from Below, 
a notion of multi-level democracy that fully integrates the contribution that subnational authorities and their communities um, can give for a fuller understanding of EU democracy. And I would say for a fuller understanding and notion of democracy to core. We concentrated our attention on the European Committee of the Regions, as a which is a consultative body of the European Union, uh, called to provide opinions on a number of policy areas without, however, being directly involved in the formal decision-making process. Uh, the prevalent scholarship was, and still is, deeply skeptical about the real contribution that this body can give to EU policymaking, and concluded, and in a way still concludes, that no one listens to uh, the committee's opinion. The COR opinions must be acquired before legislation can be approved, but the Commission, the Council and Parliament, although apparently committed to taking these opinions seriously, are however not bound to do so by any formal rule. Two main justifications have been produced to support this skeptical view. One, that the Committee of the Regions is riven by many differences and cleavages such that it could be anticipated that the stronger subnational authorities, for example, German lender, but also Spanish regions, would find other ways of making themselves heard without bothering to waste their time in the committee. And second, that the opinions of such a consultative body would be overlooked by the bigger institutional players in the EU, given its simple consultative nature. Now, we built a non-conventional argument, and we contended that precisely because the committee could not use direct or, you know, if you want necessary decision-making or vetoing powers, that to bring the subnational position to bear on decision-making, well, then it had to concentrate on contributing voice, the voice from below. And because such a voice would have been scarcely noticed, if it had been just a cacophony of voices in the plural, it would have to concentrate on what was common to the many disparate subnational authorities and learn to speak with one voice. To be honest, at the time uh, when we did our research, this was already abundantly clear among uh, COR members. They themselves were theorizing the imperative, in a way, of speaking with one voice. And all we did was to take it seriously and check whether there was empirical evidence to support this claim. In developing our notion of multi-level democracy, we used as a guide the theoretical elaboration of Professor Nadia Urbinati, a political philosopher who elaborated the principles and genealogy of representative democracy. She states in a book of 2006 that the distinctive feature of representative democracy is that of forging one voice out of many disparate ones. And that for this reason, it must not be considered as a second best to direct democracy, as much political theory has done in the past and still does. Filtering the disparate voices uh, and distilling them um, and distilling the themes that are common to all of them is the quintessence of representation. It is the forging of a we from a many disparate eyes without suppressing or excluding the peculiarity of any of them. So being able to overcome the many economic, geographic, demographic, institutional differences that distinguish subnational communities was precisely the essence of the, C of the COR, of the Committee of the Regions contribution to multi-level representative democracy. The voice that the COR could provide to EU policymaking regarded the needs and expectations of subnational communities and on the ground intelligent, intelligence as to how EU policies and decisions would impact the regional and local communities. So, um, you know, so far I've heard, I have, sorry, I have used the, uh, the term voice in a general sense 
uh, in part because it's an apt term to describe in a general fashion the contribution of regional and local communities to EU policy making, but also because it's, uh, I think, correctly, rightly at the center of your conference, of uh, you know, uh, the Tübingen conference. But I must now refine a little bit this terminology and use a more articulate theoretical template, one that better reflects Urbinati's uh, thought and that guided Justus and, my, and me in the empirical analysis of the COR contribution. The will that is expressed by making or vetoing decisions is contrasted by Urbinati, and not, by Urbinati not just to the voice in a general sense, but to a more complex notion that she calls judgment. This includes both an active component that we now redubbed voice in this more narrow and precise meaning and a more passive component, which we called surveillance. The active component in its turn consists in proposing ideas, legislations, produce pro procedures, and in activating institutions, communities, consultative processes. The passive component also consists in two uh, elements, receiving, which means implementing and assessing decisions, recommendations and policies, and surveilling in a more narrow sense, that is evaluating, monitoring, and standing guard of both decisions and procedures. Judgment, in other words, regards not only the content and the substance of decisions, but also the way in which they are made, and therefore contains also an element of democratic monitoring. What matters more than to refine the terminology, of course, is to, is to show that the richness, the richness of the contribution of regions and the Committee of the Regions in particular to representative democracy both in their active and in their passive capacity. Now, active and passive, again, these are Urbinati's uh, words, but you understand that it's a very active kind of role, both in the, in the uh, proposing and uh, activating, and also in the receiving and surveilling, of course. Um, so in the 2015 book, uh, we gave some examples drawn from an analysis of some of the activities that are characterized the COR in the previous 10 years. Um, in the remainder of this lecture, I would like to elaborate further um, with the help always of the scheme, what the COR and the regions have done since then, especially in the context of the many crises that characterized this last uh, uh, few years, um, the Euro crisis and the COVID crisis particularly. So what is the regional contribution to governing the crisis? Well, in testing this theoretical and analytical scheme against the more recent evidence, I want to focus on few activities that have been at the center of the Committee of the Region's attention and to show both the extent to which they have further developed in very interesting directions, um, they have, yeah, that they have developed in very interesting directions that convince me of the soundness of the scheme. So I think I, I want to stick to this scheme because it seems to me to still make sense and put order in what is happening. Um, uh, through the Committee of the Regions, <clears throat> but also more generally uh, at the regional level. Unfortunately, as I was saying, since the publishing of the book, I've been unable to do field research proper, and I devoted myself to other, other projects. So I've been finally able to return to this line of inquiry only more recently. So you will excuse me if most of the evidence I produce is drawn from documents, uh, rather than from uh, more sort of on the ground research interviews or applied methodology. I will briefly refer to three areas in which the Committee of the Regions has been particularly active. First, its contribution to the task force on subsidiarity and the development of this notion of active subsidiarity. Second, its opinion on the new common provision regulations, the 
uh, basically the regulations that will um, govern cohesion policy in the in the uh, in this round in the you know newly inaugurated round of cohesion policy. And three, the assessment of how the COVID pandemic and the measures that have been taken to address it um, have been received and, and, and evaluated by the Committee of the Regions. In all these spheres, the Committee of the Regions has contributed to the content of the policy decisions, so the active part and the more substantive part, but they have also, but it has also assessed the effects on the ground of their implementation and has monitored the procedures through which they were made and they were implemented and they were assessed, thus devoting equal attention both to the substance and to the democratic quality of policymaking. And I think that these two as aspects are equally important. Now, let me dwell for a moment on the task force on subsidiarity. Looking ahead to the conference of the future of, on the future of Europe, former commissioner, um, Commission President Jean-Claude Jean Juncker delineated in his white paper on the future of Europe five scenarios. Only one of them featured any real attention to the regional level, but was tellingly entitled doing less more efficiently. The question that was raised in that section was whether it would not be a good idea for the EU to scale back its involvement in a number of policy areas and repatriate these tasks to the member states, that is, scaling down the EU's commitment to regional development, for example, and giving back responsibility for state aid to member states. These were two of the examples made in that scenario. The somber mood that pervaded most scenarios, perhaps with the exception of the last one, the fifth scenario, reflecting the ongoing economic crisis following the Euro, the migrant and the Brexit crisis. And of course, little, little did uh, Juncker know of the much more severe and generalized COVID related crisis that was to hit us all in a couple of years. So commitment towards regional development seemed as a sort of luxury at the time that uh, the EU could no longer or no longer wanted to afford. The key word was justifying EU action in terms of its value added. And so the value added of cohesion policy had to be demonstrated. This line of reasoning obviously called into question the very notion of subsidiarity. Um, I know that you know everything about subsidiarity, so I skip any lengthy elaboration of this notion. Uh, I just re remind us all that there has been a tug of war in uh, producing a definition, a common, a shared definition of subsidiarity between the member states and the subnational authorities, each trying to define subsidiarity in terms of the level at which decisions should be more appropriately made, whether at the national level instead of the EU level, this was the member states perspective, or at the regional level, that is the level closest to the final receivers of the, of the policy, that is the citizens, and this was the regional perspective. The Treaty of Lisbon settled uh, temporarily this sort of definition, and as all of you know and trusted to both national and regional assemblies, the preventive monitoring of this principle uh, and of the principle of proportionality through the early warning mechanism, the yellow and the orange cards. But it also granted to the Committee of the Region the power to refer a case of infringement of these principles before the European Court of Justice, a sort of regional red card. So uh, following the Juncker five scenarios, the, commi the commission set up a subsidiarity task force, originally thought to include in equal proportions representatives from the European Parliament, the national parliaments and the committee of the regions. The three levels of representative assemblies of representative democracy, if you want. Eventually the EP decided not to take part and uh, of course, I cannot describe the, the details of this exercise, but I want to highlight a few things that I think we can, you know, usefully uh, dwell on in order to make sense of the also 
uh, of the utility of the scheme that I was presenting before. First, uh, to overcome the different ways in which subsidiarity is understood at the different levels and in different countries, the committee, the, 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 task, the um, task force proposed to elaborate, and this was a task uh, uh, entrusted to the committee of the regions, a subsidiarity grid that would allow all involved actors to carry out their assessment with, with reference to the same indicators. This is interesting, you know, it took the lead, the Committee of the Regions took the lead to define a grid to uh, analyze subsidiarity. Second, in order to make the subsidiarity control more effective, they computed that in seven years, 409 opinions on subsidiarity issues had been produced, but then these had generated only three yellow cards and no orange card. So more, um, uh, more effectiveness of this subsidiarity control. In, in this regard, several suggestions were made regarding the time given to national and regional assemblies to coordinate their actions, creating a common platform to exchange documents, and perhaps also reducing the number of assemblies necessary to issue a, a card from one third to one fourth or one fifth. But even more interesting from the point of view of our scheme was the idea of instituting a green card to signal to EU institutions when a policy decision was needed and was not forthcoming. The very essence of activating, of the activating aspect of voice. All, um, as all of us political scientists know, non-action is perhaps the strongest face of power, Stephen Loops um, uh, theorized it. Many other ideas are also contained in the final report, including that of a late card, some sort of formal subsidiarity check at the end of the legislative uh, process so, to, so as to be able to review again the respect of these principles at the end of the legislative period after a different shuttling between uh, the Council and the Parliament, or the traceability of the trilogues. Um, a strengthened impact assessment a procedure, the idea of instituting very important regional hubs where the, voice, the voices also of the non-governmental organizations and civil society could be collected and filtered up. The ability of subnational authorities to really bring EU citizens closer to EU institutions and delivering the politics of proximity had always been in a way, the, the weak side of the Committee of the Regions and stubbornly remained the least successful areas of contribution of the Committee. So re, uh, re, reg hubs, as they are called, would serve this purpose. So just to give you a glimpse how we can use that scheme to understand the subsidiarity task force. Renegotiation of cohesion policy. Let me touch on this, on a very sensitive issue here. Um, we know that the Euro crisis uh, has differentiately, uh, has differentially affected the European regions. Uh, one measure that hit particularly some regions was um, the enforcement, the, the stronger, stricter enforcement of stability measures, and particularly the fiscal compact that uh, imposed on everyone to balance the budget. Moreover, there was a period of austerity, meaning that the, balance, the budget should not only be balanced, but also be in surplus. And that, of course, led central governments to deprive regions of transfer money, uh, with which the regions would provide matching funds to structural funds, and therefore uh, engage in structural you know, investment. Now, um, the, uh, moreover, there was the, the idea of enforcing macroeconomic uh, conditionality, suspension from uh, the distribution of structural funds altogether in case of central states uh, not complying with these, you know, stability provis provisions. In any event, what I want to focus now, you know, leaving a, to the side for the moment, the emphasis um, or the consequences of the Euro crisis is this um, uh, creeping redefinition of what structural mean, means. Because it is, it, it is increasingly associated with reforms rather than with funds, acquiring an altogether new meaning. 
While with reference to cohesion policy, it indicates the funds that are aimed at making the living com conditions of EU citizens as comparable as possible in terms of their enjoyment of civic, economic, and social rights, wherever they live, the, the very notion of territorial cohesion. Well, now they are being associated with reforms. They mean something else. They mean that um, all the factors of production, which means financial capital, but also workforce, but also infrastructure, should be made more um, uh, efficient and should serve the greater purpose of, uh, you know, relaunching growth in the European Union. So this is, in terms of development theory, is really a return to the past. Um, after World War II, there was a notion of a factor of production-led uh, strategy of regional development, but that was replaced by a more place-based approach in the 80s and in the 90s. So now this reversal, this flip-flop back to the past, um, runs the risk of really getting rid or denying the notion of territorial cohesion and, um, and of renationalizing cohesion policy. So precisely because pro policy proposals do not just have a substantive element, but also a procedural one, um, this factor of production approach places um, at center stage national authorities. And this triggered the reaction of the Committee of the Regions, and in particular, President, past President Karl Heinz Lambert, uh, to uh, consider using the red card of a, a referral to the European Court of Justice. Um, because um, in, uh, in a resolution of uh, February uh, 2018, the Committee of the Regions really rejected the argument put forth by the Commission that the use of the performance reserve on the structural funds, on cohesion funds, to favor structural reforms, as meant by EMU, um, the, the Commission argued that it complied with the subsidiarity principle, but the Committee of the Regions argued against this and wanted to address us access the European Court of Justice. So um, uh, it was an attempt, it was evaluated as an attempt to renationalize cohesion policy. So the danger of this the refinition, the redefinition of the term structural is not over. The next generation EU while it distributes a lot of money to EU member states, raising them in part from, through issuing EU bonds and in part by increasing its own resources. There are interesting proposals on uh, several EU-wide taxation. However, it connects again, the disbursement of these funds, the next generation, the, the resilience and um, recovery and resilience funds, uh, not only to a strict timeline, which is a fine idea, but also to the criteria of the European semester. So the notion of structural is still at risk of being redefined and its translation into concrete action uh, also within the new cohesion policy regulation will need to be monitored. I conclude by saying two words, really two words on regions and the COVID pandemic. Um, it's the newest uh, crisis, it's the newest challenge. Uh, you are probably familiar with the notion of a syndemic rather than of a pandemic, in the sense that health issues very often compound also social and economic issues and can result in a, in a differentiated geography of crisis related to health, um, health emergencies. Uh, now, um, I identify, generally speaking, four areas of concern that seem to me to be particular interest to the regions in connection with the COVID pandemic. But on these, I have done less research. So it's just um, sort of a, an agenda for future research. The first and more scaring is the suspension of the common market rule in, in several countries and the equally panicky suspension, temporary panicky suspension of Schengen. 
and how they impacted on many transborder regions that perceived themselves as one. And I happened to live in one of them, really. That was a shock to uh, Zutirol, Tirol, and Trentino uh, uh, Euro region. Second, the destruction of regional funds to pay for medical equipment, which was a, an emergency measure uh, dictated by, you know, the, the, the real emergency, um, was okay at the moment, but, um, you know, in many ways um, signals that cohesion policy or structural funds are used as a as a bag from which to uh, draw resources for other uh, goals, for example, for supporting the labor force that was either um, dismissed or was suffering temporary cutbacks during the pandemic. Third, the differential impact of the pandemic on regional communities and, and, and economies needs to be further monitored. And so the, the voice from below will need to be forthcoming also in the future and be very attentive to the different ways in which regions have been affected. And fourth, the way in which uh, the management of the pandemic has revealed a, a differential capacity to implement containment measures has suggested in many countries a re-centralization of many policies, for example, health policy. And, uh, and it's so impressing in a way, a federalizing um, pressure to the European Union, which would put at the center of dialogue, member states and the uh, EU institutions, and perhaps sidelining again, the regional uh, level. So um, I, you know, I, I see that the clock is ticking. So I conclude here only to say that there are always many, many uh, issues and areas for which an attention to the regional subnational level is necessary. And I stick to my guns in many ways in thinking that the four partite uh, um, analysis or scheme that I was proposing to you, active and passive, uh, proposing, activating, receiving, and uh, surveilling, is still valid to uh, assess the role of the regions, not only in EU policy making, but also in EU multi-level democracy. And I stop here for the moment. Thank you very much, Simona. Thanks for your for sharing your ideas with us. Thanks for sharing your um, assessment here of what has been going on in, in the last couple of years and linking that to more systematic uh, considerations about uh, EU uh, democracy. And again, I encourage our uh, listeners to put their questions in, in the chat so that we can uh, take them up. So while you think about questions to put in the chat, I can come up uh, with a question uh, myself. I, I just start at the end of your presentation because uh, I would be interested in, we, we because in Germany we've seen this re-centralization of powers in the pandemic. And I'm sure that after the pandemic, we will have a new discussion about territorial politics in a number of member states which have more federal, uh, federalized or regionalized structures. Uh, but uh, it's been certainly efficient, whatever efficiency is, then to different uh, degrees. So uh, where in the Italian case do you see that um, this re centralization and i agree with you that obviously the way that the uh, that the funds is going to be managed that there is uh, from many regions uh, that they would say well it's not sufficiently reflecting regional concerns um, and there is uh, too much of having uh, the central government's uh, impact here on the plans for how the, the resilience fund should be uh, spent in the respective country. So can you maybe give some examples from, from the Italian case? Yes, um, yes, I can, in the sense that the COVID uh, was very interesting in many ways. First of all, because um, the pandemic hit differently, different regions, but 
in uh, sometimes unexpected ways. The first wave uh, impacted more the northern industrial, more um, um, you know, thickly uh, urbanized uh, regions of Italy, uh, and they fared worse than the south. Um, the second wave uh, was a bit of the reverse. So in a way, the structural endowment of regions and their preparedness to cope with the, uh, with the pandemic was revealed in the second wave. But it, both in the first and in the second, there were interesting exceptions. So um, in many ways, this revealed a much more differentiated and less simple reading of uh, regional differentiation in Italy. The other interesting thing, and probably this may contrast a little bit, or again, maybe similar to Germany, I don't know, would be again a, an interesting comparison to run. Um, in Italy, you know, we don't have a regional chamber or a, a second chamber of uh, territorial of um, territorial representation, but we have a more informal, say, consultative body, uh, which is called conference of uh, regional and, and local authorities, and that was super activated. I mean, it was, you know, sort of really um, pent up and, and boost, uh, boosted up during the pandemic. It became really a constant dialogue, the, the, the venue of the, the, the opportunity for a constant dialogue between various ministers and the uh, regional governors. Um, so whether this now, with, whether the, 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 some of the weaknesses of some regions will lead to more centralization, for example, of health policy, or vice versa, whether the regions, some regions could demonstrate their ability to cope even beyond stereotypical divisions that we have in mind. Um, I don't know how it's going to play out in Italy, but I am, I'm, you know, I, I was reminded, of course, of uh, a mechanism that you uh, know very well, which is the joint decision trap kind of interaction, right? Uh, and I was wondering whether it could work the usual way, giving more power to the the federals, uh, to the to the federal level, that is the the region, the lender, or to the central level. So. Would it be a joint decision trap or a reversed joint decision trap? I think this is a would be a very interesting comparison and and um, and analysis to be completed. Uh, you know, going down the you know in the future. The other thing is that next generation EU con contains this strong linkage to the European semester, which is a very obviously a very centralized exercise, and so um, that of course ways um, against a, a you know a, a big role being granted to the to the regions in both uh, Germany and Italy but I think it's a very interesting area that we should monitor I don't know how it's gonna play out but I think we should keep monitoring it yes I I, I certainly agree very much because there will be a lot going on uh, in this uh, area in the next couple a couple of months certainly and um, do you have then any ideas uh, what this what you would like to see here then in terms of uh, procedures stronger procedures uh, for the regional voice here uh, how they could have a, a stronger effect here and um, and secondly, there is uh, now a question in the chat, the more theoretical nature, the normative significance of the role or function of voice that your framework attaches to regions and the committee of regions with regard to the established facets of the EU's democratic uh, deficit. So uh, more con conceptual question. Okay. okay. Okay, allow me to, to, to start from uh, this last question. Um, 
you know, I always try to um, sort of uh, check myself and not be uh, driven in my research or in my conclusion by my own um, likes or dislikes, okay? Uh, so I, I keep asking myself, even when I analyze what the Committee of the Regions does, um, whether they're always reminding EU institutions that they want to be at the center has any fundamental meaning or whether it's just institutional play. You know, we know that institutions are very good at uh, perpetuating themselves, filling, you know, space. So uh, do they really contribute to a richer notion of democracy? Like the question that was raised uh, is implicitly asking. And uh, my answer is yes. Um, so in a general sense, regardless of the then the specificities of what the Committee of the Regions asks today or tomorrow or yesterday. But I think that yes, to involve more uh, closely a number of levels and citizens in different capacities as uh, voters at national at European elections, as voters at national elections, as voters at regional parliamentary elections, as um, policy makers, as policy takers, as um, members of, of organizations or non-governmental organizations or other types of asso associations. I think it makes democracy richer. The problem of EU democracy in particular is that it does not, it's not similar to any of the democracies that we know nationally. It's not a parliamentary democracy. It's not a presidential democracy. It's a very complex kind of democracy, if at all. Some people say it's not even a democracy. So I think that complementing representative bodies, you know, with a rich consultation with citizens in different capacities at different levels of aggregation is a contribution. It may be a confusing contribution, perhaps, but in the end, um, having multiple venues, and multiple channels, I think it will be positive for uh, the European Union claiming that it does listen to its own citizens, because the risk is that it's perceived too distant. Now, the first question was about how, what channels, what procedures. And I think that the task force on subsidiarity suggested a number of ways. Um, some are more institutional, like the late card or the green card, um, giving more time, for example, you know, to raise you know, subsidiarity issues. But others, for example, the enactment of the regional hubs is potentially interesting. Now, again, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So we have to see <laughs> how these regional hubs will be implemented. And this is, again, a wonderful field of research. Um, but to have sort of a, a, a yeah, a, a hub, a place, a, 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 a venue where uh, also non-governmental organizations or more, or, you know, functional associations or segmental associations could go and raise their concerns would be, I think, very positive. And then it could be somehow percolate up, uh, filtered up to the more institutional levels. Because the danger otherwise is that the voices, if, if we all try to get at the European Union level directly, fantastic as it, as it might sound, might really be, you know, might uh, convey too weak voices or to voices that are too garbled. And, and then what happens normally is that these institutions have to use these macros or apps to extract, to, to, to text mine the, um, you know, the uh, suggestions and the contributions. And so you end up speaking with a machine in a way, um, rather than with um, representatives that could make sense of, of of your remarks, your opinions, your needs, your uh, observations, and then craft, and craft them in a more general and stronger voice. So the reg, the reg hub are promising. We'll have to see how they play out. This is a way in which, one of the ways in which uh, the voice could be channeled. Okay, yes, it's, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there is 
not yet another question in the chat, but there might be uh, some more coming up. Um, so in between, the green card is an idea floating around for quite a while. And if this green card would be developed in an instrument which is more effective also for regions, right? There's always, of course, the question if it's then regional uh, governments or regional parliaments. That's, of course, an important part of the discussion here. But there is another aspect which we uh, already addressed in the previous session this morning is that the strength of regions is just very, very different and that we already have in many ways. Uh, I, I'm not saying a dominant position, but uh, certainly better uh, conditions more activism among those regions with legislative competencies. So anything in that direction could then increase the, the hierarchy among those regions who have legislative competencies, who are stronger, who are often much more resourceful than regions without these legislative uh, competencies. Do you see a risk here which would then have an effect on the democratic quality among regions? Well, I see, Gabriele, um, you know, I normally uh, do not immediately uh, equate uh, institutional powers with uh, either a greater dynamism or a greater capacity to impact um, the EU policy making process. I think, you know, I, I discovered over and over again, comparing very weak and very strong regions in many um, policy areas, that um, the reasons for really getting mobilized and getting, getting active and using several ways of reaching or shaping, as we say, with ideas, with proposals, etc., cetera, uh, EU policy making is very differentiated. I, I noticed, for example, in the past that, you know, uh, British regions or that among the weakest of all in the past, um, you know, were sometimes more active in some policy areas than even German lender. So it all depends on what, um, um, you know, what is the aim, whether it's a, a policy decision or a concrete policy decision, wh whether it's an institutional, again, recognition. So I don't associate necessarily <clears throat> institutional powers with greater capacity to, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, uh, have, a, have an impact on EU policy making. So again, I would, I would want to see how the reg leg group or the, the individual regions within this um, uh, group, regions with legislative powers, uh, act. Because my sense is as a group, the group is not spectacularly um, uh, active. Now, you certainly have better uh, on the ground and, you know, sort of empirical um, evidence than I do because you have been tilling this, uh, this field for a long time and so you know and you have the evidence. But my sense, very partial sense, is that um, they may feel they are in a different league, but in terms of punching uh, at the European policy making process, I'm not so sure. The other uh, actors that we're not talking about now because we're concentrating on regions is of course cities. And cities have um, you know, regained a lot of centrality and they, they are also punching above the waist in many ways. Um, so again, I would want to carry out empirical research and then see which um, uh, regions with legislative powers are indeed uh, willing and, and capable of contributing and of reaching um, the, the EU uh, policy making uh, decision um, uh, levels, or uh, and which are not, and for what reasons. If I may, what is your experience? Since I could not attend the conference, but what is your evidence, if, if I may? <laughs> Uh, 
Hey, the evidence is still very much a mixed bag uh, because uh, still what we see, uh, like Annalena Hugenauer yesterday, she presented that uh, still um, the instruments that are out there, uh, particularly via the early warning system, are used uh, very, very differently by uh, regions. But this is only a very, very small aspect because as we saw uh, this morning from the presentation from Frau Kosel from the Bavarian Landtag, the liaison office, it was a, an impressive, this array of activities they are involved in at EU level uh, with uh, other regions such as a trans-regional uh, cooperation here. But again, that is a real challenge for uh, for a regional uh, parliament in this case, because resources matter. And we know that a number of the resources are not that much on the regional level or a lot of control by central level governments over the um, resources uh, at hand at, at regional level. And that is certainly a key issue. And I would agree with you in terms of cohesion policy and uh, what, what's going to happen with the funds. It's certainly not going to get easier for the regions here. Another thing that I think another idea that was aired and uh, in the uh, task force on subsidiarity, and which might help the uh, dialogue between the national parliaments and the regional parliaments is having this uh, uh, the same uh, um, platform, uh, documentary and uh, dialogical platform that it, it has been a bit uh, divided and, and segmented. So that sometimes even just uh, keeping in touch with one another is quite complicated for them. So I wonder whether um, that has made any progress, any real progress from uh, the recommendations or the ideas of the task force. But this is a more conversation. I'm sorry, I don't, wa don't want to dodge questions by asking questions, but I, I was really curious. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, not a problem, because it's pretty obvious that there are still so many issues which are of interest for researchers uh, to be uh, empirically investigated, to be theorized. Uh, and that's uh, for researchers. That That is certainly uh, interesting. And uh, I'm sure that we will follow up on that. So we, we have to come to an end for this um, keynote lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Simona, for being with us here, even if it was only virtually, but uh, at least that is still possible. It was great to discuss that with you. And um, uh, thanks uh, to all um, people, to the audience who are listening to us.